In this sub lesson, I want to talk about developing a risk management program. And let's use a case study. Let's use a real world scenario. So let's say at Brio, for our own organization, we're going to roll out an initiative, which is a BYOD initiative, bring your own device, okay? And we've got a lot of users who've just upgraded to the new iPhone. We have a specialty pads. We have a wide variety of devices. Most of them are provisioned and sanctioned, but we do have people showing up with unprovisioned devices. So we're going to roll out a program, which is going to use IEEE 802.1X PNAC, okay, port-based network access control, and we're going to try to use a certificate-based solution. So we're going to use EAP TLS. So this is a risk management program that is specifically for this BYOD initiative, okay? That being said, our security team wants to go through several steps in this program. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about and discuss the purpose of our program. Well, we know the purpose of our program, okay? It's a BYOD initiative. But what is the context of the program? Are we trying to control and manage just provision devices? Are we going to also onboard devices? Are they going to be BYOD, are they going to be corporate owned devices that are provisioned to the end user? So we want to think about the context. What type of control do we need to have while the user is on site? And if they're using the device, for example, outside of the enterprise, outside of the campus, are we going to use something like Cisco Umbrella for those particular devices? So we have to lay down the purpose and the context, okay? Next is the scope, right? Well, we've, we've outlaid the scope, okay? But you know, if it's not a BYOD environment and it's something else, well, the, this scope could change. For example, if we're moving from, let's say, a private cloud solution and we're going to start using cloud computing, let's say a SaaS solution, well, is the scope going to be a hybrid where we're going to be storing some of the data in virtual servers locally, some of the applications, and then we're going to be sharing the responsibility in a hybrid cloud, or is the scope a total public cloud? Okay, and if it's a total public cloud, that's the scope. Are we going to use, let's say, a, a broker between to provide security and encryption and uh, visibility and context identity? So, those are what's the scope of the initiative? And there needs to be a charter. So, the scope of the charter needs to be driven by the C suite. Maybe not the entire C suite, but it should it should come from executive management. That's where the charter should come from. Now, this is a program we're talking about. So we're talking about a risk management program. This is not a project, okay? A project has a start and a finish, and it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's in its own box, right? This is a, a, a program which is typically ongoing, okay? So we want to remember that. Not a project, but a program. So we also have to establish who has the authority, okay? Perhaps you, the CISO, right, at Brio, you have the authority. You're the C team authority in the situation. Also, how are we going to structure this, okay? Is this going to be a real top-down initiative, or are we going to kind of flatten it out and kind of dispense the responsibilities, maybe on a department-by-department -department basis, okay? So we might make, uh, you know, have a separate wireless BYOD and then a, a wired, you know. So we have to think about, is this going to be done departmentally, business unit, uh, those types of things? And, and what are the reporting mechanisms that we're going to use? Obviously, we're dealing with assets here. So in a BYOD environment, these are some very important considerations. How do we identify the asset, okay? How do we tag the asset? Is it done with RFID? Are we using some other mechanism? How do we understand devices that are provisioned and non-provisioned? How do we classify the devices, the objects? How do we classify the subjects, okay, the individual people using the devices? And what level of ownership do we have? And this goes back to a, you know, in a BYOD, the individual employee owns the device. If it's more of a corporate owned, a COPE, a COPE environment, then the company owns the device and it's basically provisioned to the employee. And there's different variants of that. Okay, some uh, employees, you may not have, you know, a universal plan. Uh, some business units, some groups may use COPE, some may use BYOD, okay? In managing these devices, what are our objectives, okay? We have to think about, you know, data loss and data breach, data leakage, okay? And we have different approaches, and we're going to talk about this when we get to the mobility 
area, but you know, are we gonna partition certain data on that phone, okay? How are we gonna handle the compartmentalization of company data and PII and PHI? So obviously, when it comes to using cellular devices and mobile devices, managing risk, a lot of times just comes down to managing data, okay? Data leakage and data loss. What methodology are we gonna use, okay? We have a wide variety of choices. Uh, if we're gonna go with MDM and or MAM, so we have device management software, enterprise solutions that we can use. We can also offload some of this uh, to a cloud provider, you know, if we need to do that, especially if we have a lot of users who are remote or teleworkers, okay? And so once you make these decisions, once you have the purpose and the context and the scope, and the charter, you identify the authority, the structure, how you're going to report, okay? Once you identify your assets and you classify them and you get your objectives and you choose your methodology and your implementation team comes next, okay? So choosing the team to implement your BYOD initiative. And so these are the seven main steps in developing a risk management program. And again, at Brio, we're going to be using the BYOD example. One option you can use, is there's several risk management methodologies. One we could use is Octave, and we're gonna break down Octave a little bit later on, but Octave is an acronym, by the way, and Octave stands for Operationally Critical Threat Asset and Vulnerability Evaluation. So you can see, it's one of those methodologies that falls right into play here. So it would be perfect for our BYOD initiative. It's one of the best known risk management methodologies it's a structured approach, okay, to evaluating risk. It addresses operational risk, security practices, and the technologies that are going to be used to mitigate this risk. So again, you know, the technology in our situation, we're going to go with H2.1X, and we're going to use EAP TLS and have certificates, and digital certificates on all of those devices, okay? So when you compare Octave to other methodologies, uh, it's more strategic. Okay, not so much tactical as strategic, but it doesn't just focus on the technology, but practices and processes as well. This is also a methodology that you can you know, learn to use in-house instead of having to bring in third-party consultants. So if you can invest the time and the education in your own staff to use Octave, it's gonna save you a lot of money in the long run. So as you can see here in the diagram, it all begins with preparation. That's the first phase. Phase one, is again, taking the strategic organizational view, right? So what are our assets in our situation? What are our mobility assets? What are the threats to those assets, okay? What are we currently doing now? What is our current uh, mobile device practice? What do we have on our written security policy now? The AUP over using mobile devices. What are vulnerabilities that are organizational? Okay, so from a, from a broad strategic level, what are our vulnerabilities? And then what are our requirements organizationally? So that's gonna be discovered first. Then in phase two, we get down to the technological view. You know, what are the key components of getting those certificates deployed on all of those iPhones and Androids, okay? What are the operating systems we're using? So what are the key components? How are we gonna get those certificates in an EAP TLS environment? And then what are some of the technical challenges that we have? What are some vulnerabilities? What are some challenges, right? And again, this is all gonna be rolled out through a progressive series of Octave workshops. And then phase three is strategy and plan development, where we're going to plan and develop based on risks, our agreed upon strategy, and the workshops will have as a result, their output will be some mitigation plans. So there's an example of using Octave. Another popular risk management principle and guideline is ISO, okay? ISO is 31,000-2009. It offers principles, it offers a framework, it also offers processes for risk management. And it can be used by any organization, regardless of its size. So you would look at Octave more from a big organization. The good thing about ISO 31,000 is even the small business can benefit from this, okay? Helping them increase the likelihood of reaching their goals, improving the identification of opportunities, 
and threats and a effectively allocating and using their, ri their resources for whatever risk handling or risk treatment they agree upon. So this is a good solution for people who create and protect value in the organization. Uh, you know, a, a, a chief risk officer, for example, a CRO would use uh, ISO IEC 31000-2009, okay? And it goes through a pretty elaborate revision process, and you always want to make sure that you, you know, stay up to speed on what ISO is doing here. So if we look at this particular diagram, okay, which, by the way, is not used to certify or accredit, okay, it, it's, it provides guidance especially for internal and external auditing programs. So remember, this particular 31,000 is not a certification or accreditation process, right? But it is internationally recognized. It's a benchmark with sound principles. So if you look at the diagram, at the top we have, of course, establishing the context, okay? So again, our context here, let's, let's move to a different example, okay? Uh, let's, let's say we're going to move away from the BYOD. We used BYOD, let's say, for Octave. So let's say for ISO IEC, we're going to use a different example. We're going to introduce a CASPI, okay? So we've got a SaaS solution with, let's say, Salesforce or Workday, uh, you know, Microsoft Office 365. So we want to introduce a access security broker, okay, initiative for all of our customers who use Workday and Office 365, okay? So we're gonna use this initiative, this methodology, to recommend a third-party company. So we establish the context, we identify our risks, we analyze our risk, we evaluate our risk, we determine how we're gonna treat the risk by using this SaaS solution, and we determine we're gonna use someone like Forcepoint or CloudBlock as opposed to Microsoft's own Caspi solution. So we use this initiative, we use all of these principles, and in the end, we determine that instead of using Microsoft for the, the Caspi with Office 365 and Workday, we're going to use another vendor, let's say CloudLock, okay, because they're more mature and they offer more features. So an example of what we're going to go with. So if you notice here in the diagram again, that risk assessment is made up of the three middle components, and that's important, okay? So risk identification, this is what can happen, when, where, how, and why, okay? You're gonna combine gap analysis and vulnerability assessment. You're often identifying the key processes, the key tasks, the key activities, recognizing the key risk areas, okay, that we have in using a SaaS solution over the internet, okay? due to lack of adequate control. So do we have inadequate identity and context security? Do we have inadequate confidentiality mechanisms, okay? How do we optimize this solution for not just people that are using this inside the, the campus, but for our teleworkers and our mobile users, okay? So we're gonna define, we're gonna categorize, and we're gonna prioritize all of the risks of using uh, this SaaS solution. Then there's risk analysis. Remember, that's part of risk assessment, okay? Identifying our controls, administrative, technical, physical. What's the likelihood? What are the probabilities, okay, of different events and incidents? Uh, the consequences, the impact, okay? We want to determine risk levels, you know, uh, and we want to have meaningful metrics. And if, if I'm in an environment using, let's say, open fair, I'm going to be using calibrated estimates on a case-by-case, scenario-by-scenario basis uh, for the, the, quote, dangers of using this SaaS solution. The final risk assessment component is risk evaluation. These activities are basically comparing reality against the necessary needed criteria, identifying and assessing all the options, okay, uh, deciding on our response to a, an outbreak or a breach, when we're using Office 365 over the cloud, and we want to establish our priorities. And so these things will lead to an RTP, a risk treatment plan, where we identify each information asset that's been flagged in the risk assessment report. So remember, the risk assessment report is going to be driven by identification, analysis, and evaluation, okay? And so 
we're going to flag in the report the areas of unacceptable levels of risk based on how we're going to treat and handle risk. And then we want to report and state the method of treatment. What are we going to use to handle this? Okay, well, we determined, I already kind of gave you the, the end result. We're going to use a CASPI to uh, deal with our risk. Okay, we're going to, in a way, you could consider this as far as risk treatment goes, we're going to offload this risk or we're going to share the risk by investing in using a cloud access security broker. Here's some key terms that I want you to know for risk management for the CASP exam, okay? Risk exception or exemptions. This is basically involving uh, accepted non-compliance. So these are areas that you're going to allow to be exemptions, okay? Non-compliance with policies and standards for specific reasons, okay? Uh, they could be easy to identify when the policy requirements are clearly stated. Okay, uh, who will take ownership and accountability though over exemptions? That's important. The buck has to stop somewhere, and you're my CISO, so the buck's going to stop with you. You have to deal with regulators and compliance uh, personnel in the exceptions that we that we're going to make. Okay, and we want to include these in your review cycle so they show up in policy reviews and ongoing audits. A second term is deterrence. Deterrence is a type of risk control, okay? It involves putting into place systems and policies, countermeasures of particular risk events by protecting against exploitation of vulnerabilities that can't be eliminated. Most risk management decisions focus on mitigation and deterrence, balancing costs and resources against the level of risk that's acceptable and the mitigation that we can afford to put in place. We then have inherent risk versus residual risks. Okay, the ISO standards 31,000 and 27,001 both define residual risk as the risk remaining after risk treatment. COSO's integrated internal control framework from 2013 defines residual risk in the context of objectives as the risk to the achievement of objectives that remains after management's responses have been developed and implemented, okay? Uh, COSO also says it's the risk remaining after management's response to the risk. So in a nutshell, residual risk is the modified risk after internal controls have been implemented and monitored and the effect of their findings have been considered. Inherent risk is also referred to as evaluation risk. COSO describes inherent risk as the absence of any actions that management might take to alter either the risk probability or impact. It's interesting that ISO 31000 doesn't even mention the term inherent risk anywhere. It just calls it risk. So in a nutshell, inherent risk is the risk that an event would result in if no controls or other mitigating factors were in place, okay? Think of it as the gross risk or the risk before controls, okay? Inherent risk, the risk before controls, residual risk, the risk after controls.